I'd like to firstly uh, start by asking you a few questions. This is our second study, of course, on providence. But how close is God to you? And how close do you feel to him? Uh, is he near in your thoughts? Uh, do you allow God often to work in your life? And if you do, do you work with God? Or is God somewhere tucked away, somewhere in the corners of your life, and you, and you don't bring him out very often? And that's where we're heading tonight, brothers and sisters. We're going to show the greatness of God, but at the same time, I want to show how God should be close to us in our life, and every minute of our life, think about him. Because brothers and sisters and young people, he should be sitting there right next to you, holding your hand. And that's how lovely and how wonderful our God is. It's just some lessons from last week. We, we learnt that we must allow God to work in our life, to be more conscious of his loving hand. We also learnt last week that there is no such thing as chance in our life. Our lives are in the hand of God. Chris Adolphus should throw out the word chance out of our vocabulary uh, altogether. It should not be there. We learn also to commit our way to God, to trust in him. He always knows what is right for us, even if we don't. Uh, think about that. And We look, talked about those things last week. We learn never to force providence, but rather to cooperate with like faithful David. He didn't force the situation, he cooperated with it. And we learn also with Moses, who thought he was ready to lead Israel out of Egypt. God said, no, you're not going to be ready for another 40 years until you've tended sheep for 40 years. And sometimes we need to be patient with our God. It's God's time frame is far different to our time frame. We want instant results, flick of the switch, it must happen right away. It doesn't work that way in God's time frame. It can take many years. And we must learn at times to see the bigger picture and never to be discouraged. So that's some of the things which we learned last week and it builds into tonight, which is called the bigger picture because providence is not a theory. It is a reality. It happens every day of our life. God is in control. And sometimes we like, like that word control. It's like everything is being manipulated by God. Well, how about we use the word managed? Everything is managed by God, brothers and sisters, in our life. He manages everything. He gives us freedom of choice. We know that because every Sunday we ask God for forgiveness of our sins. We sin, we fall short. We have that freedom of choice. But what God does when we make mistakes is he steps in and works a little bit harder to get us on the right track again. And he manages all things to make good out of it that we might be ready for the kingdom. And every day God is trying to make us ready for the kingdom. You think of Abraham and Sarah and the mistakes which Abraham particularly made. God stepped in and worked with that. Elijah running from God, will God turn him around? Jonah thought, well, I'm going to run away from my responsibility. God says, no, no, you're not. I'm going to prepare a whale, which, which is never in the Mediterranean. Months beforehand, a whale is already travelling through the Mediterranean to pick him up, save him in, the, in his own gizzards for three days, spew him out onto dry land so that Jonah might still fulfil his work. Jonah wasn't ready beforehand. He certainly was afterwards. And each occasion, everybody has freedom of choice to make the right decision. But you know, like I know, we don't always make the right decision in life. And we make some dreadfully awful decisions. Does God just give up and say, no, there's no hope for this individual anymore? No, he doesn't. He steps in and he helps us and he works through his providential hand. The trick is we just need to see that and cooperate with a loving Heavenly Father. Just like to give you a few couple ground rules on Proverbs, uh, sorry, on providence, which, which I really enjoy, on how we should view providence in life. There's a lovely little quote which comes out of verse 11 of this psalm, which says, The counsel of Yahweh holds good for the olam, or forever. The olam, which means the hidden period, or the millennium. Everything that God does, all his counsels, all his judgments, are, are building up for that particular time, the millennium, the, the time when Christ will return. The intentions of his heart from age to age, whatever age, whatever time frame in life, everything that God does is for that particular period. It's all building up for that. And maybe another good one we could throw into that, a little bit out of context, but I think the principle is the same. That God does everything with a cause. We may not always understand all those causes, this side of the kingdom. Uh, and one day we will find out those things in due course. It might take us years, it might take us until the time of the kingdom. We'll really understand why some things happen in our life. But all things happen for a cause. That's just some, hopefully, some, some uh, ground rules on, on providence before we start tonight. So here's our, our tonight. We're looking at providence in creation. We're then going to go to providence in politics and prophecy. Then we're going to look at providence in our personal lives through trial and suffering and then lessons. 
So what we're going to do is we're building up layer upon layer. We weren't ready for this last week, but we're ready for it this week. And as we build layer upon layer, we're, we're ready to tackle some, some, some more difficult subjects as we focus back on ourselves at the end of the night on why trial and suffering does happen in our life. Try to categorise it a bit and get some encouragement from it as well. So what we're going to do is look at providence and creation, show how great God is in creation and what he does and how he still is managing things. Then look at politics and prophecy and some of the amazing things which we know are happening but how God is in control of those things. And then step back down to our lives again and see, wow, in amongst all of that effort, all that work, and all that effort that God is putting into the nations and in creation, he's still interested in little you and me. It's a lovely, lovely subject, brothers and sisters and young people. And we can take so much encouragement that God loves us. He wants us in the kingdom. Uh, he's called us for a reason. We're all here. We're all here tonight for a reason. That's to be in the kingdom. And he does everything for the Olam, as we saw. So, providence in creation. We'll just look at this psalm which we read tonight, Psalm 33. And just look at the build-up. Turn over the page to verse 6. And I've actually coloured in some of these words in my margin. You look at this is how powerful God was in creation. By the word of Yahweh were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now, we had four children around our tea time table, and Dad would speak occasionally, which was me, and quite often it falls on deaf ears. <laughs> Mum speaks and children listen a little bit more. Uh, don't know why that is, it's just a, a phenomenon in life. God speaks, the whole universe is created. You think of that, he spoke the earth into existence. Rickster speaks, and a couple of people listen, but just walk away and don't do anything. <laughs> but God speaks, everything happens. And that's what verse 6 is saying. Look at verse 7. He gathered the waters of the sea together by a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now, they should be highlighted, uh, those, those words, uh, in your Bibles. God spake the universe into existence. You think of that. And what we're going to show you, brothers and sisters, is that we're actually not trivial in the midst of all that. You think, that's, that's incredible power. How can you make something out of nothing? How can, you, how can you manipulate all these particles, molecules and all these things? Bang! And you've got a globe. And you've got all these seas and all this land and all these trees and plants and animals on it. And yet he's still interested in us in verse 18. Behold, the eye of Yahweh is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. And what we're trying to show, and certainly by the end of the night, we'll show that God well, is not limited in power. We are not trivial in his sight. Nothing is too hard for our God. You know, quite often we, we quote the words, don't we? Uh, what is man, for man that thou art mindful of him? And we feel insignificant in the sight of this, this awesome God. But the whole point is, brothers and sisters and young people, he is interested in you, he is interested in your future, your salvation, and he's doing everything to get you into the kingdom. Uh, whether there's circumstances in your life which happen that you don't like, they're all there for the olam and for a purpose. You have a look at this, and we know these quotes quite well. Providence and creation. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Or well, Matthew uh, chapter 10, which we have there, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without the father knowing. And, and so this is his creation. So God is intimately interested in his creation. We think, oh, just a sparrow, just a scavenger. Look at the sparrow out there in the schoolyard just picking up all the scraps. And we think nothing of that animal. And yet you can go out in the middle of the desert, you can go out uh, in the middle of Australia, and you'll find a meaningless scavenger sparrow there. When it dies, God knows. And he says, well, you're, you're of more interest to me than that sparrow. And I believe, brothers and sisters and young people, you could add that to any animal. You know, this time of year we, we get sick of ants, we get out the ant ridden, we spray all the ants that come into our homes. Uh, God is mindful of all those things. Uh, just as he is mindful of that sparrow which falls to the ground. You know, sometimes God can be so big that we just cannot comprehend how big he is. And we think, well, I'm nothing compared to that. And yet this very sparrow is a lesson to us, brothers and sisters. Every time you see a sparrow, a common little sparrow scavenging out in the schoolyard, think, God appreciates you as more worth than that little sparrow. You're of more value to him. 
Have a think about the stars in which God has made from Psalm 147. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Uh, he's created these things. He brings out the host by number. He calls them by their names. You know, brothers and sisters and young people, on a starry night, go up to Glenlock. I'm not sure if you'll see it up here at Golden Grove. You can see approximately 10,000 stars with the naked eye. 10,000. Uh, obviously, as the, as the night goes on, you see hundreds of thousands because more appear as, as the earth rotates around. You know how it works. That's a lot of descendants for Abraham because he is told his, his seed would be like the stars of heaven. God calls them all by name. Now, I could go out and call a star by name tonight. I could go out tomorrow night, have no idea which star I just pointed out and called by name. But God knows that. God knows every single star and you can call it by name. That's incredible power. Just to give you an experience that we had as a family once, we were over in Perth on our six-month trip of Australia and we were out near the, um, the Wave Rock. Anybody been to the Wave Rock in Western Australia? There was a little a man-made observatory out near there. We went out there one night to this observatory and this guy in his shed had this big telescope which he wheeled out on little tractor tyres, pushed out, and it, we pointed up to Jupiter, we pointed up to Saturn, to Mars, uh, Saturn was excellent because we saw the rings around it, and he said to the, us audience, uh, including our family, look, is there anything you want me to point the, the telescope to that you want to see? And Rick's to the bright spark that he says, says, yeah, I want to see what that brighter star up there looks like. And he said, are you sure? I said, absolutely I do. So okay, so psh, he gets, it winds around like this and, he, and it's doing all by hand and he points it at this brighter star uh, up there in the sky. And he said, okay, your turn to have a look at it. So I climbed up the stairs, looked through the pier hole on the side and you know what I saw? I saw a cluster of millions of stars. And he said, I'm going to blow your mind even more. He said, every star that you see out there tonight, every bright star is exactly the same. Inside that bright star is galaxy after galaxy after galaxy of small stars. Psalm 147 says, God can call them all by name. You think of that. You think about the sand upon the seashore. Abraham is told also in, in Genesis that uh, his seed would be like the sand of the seashore. Now, if you go down to the sea seashore, go to Port Hughes, uh, the steel's favourite place to go on earth, you pick up a handful of sand. Uh, in your hand is about the same amount of sand as what there is stars at night time, about 10,000. Uh, obviously, you, some other beaches you're going to have more than that, but that's fine. But, but the point is, you can, you've got the same amount of grains in your hand. Now, if God knows all the stars of heaven by name and, and, and he's made them all, that means he could count every single bit of sand in your hand. Now, you add to that, every beach in Australia, go to every beach in the whole earth, God could count every single bit of sand, putting those quotes together. He could count every single one of them. How does he do that? Because Psalm 33 says he spoke and the world came into existence. He knows every grain of sand, every animal. He knows everything about our life. And everything he does in our life is for good. He spoke the earth into existence. So when we go to Psalm 34 and verse 3, which we quoted last week, it says, O magnify Yahweh with me, let us exalt his name together. And the word magnify means to make him big. Make God big in your life. And there is a danger, brothers and sisters and young people, that we make God too small in our life. And we, we tuck him into a little corner of our life. We only bring him out every now and then when, when big things maybe happen in our life. But he's there every single point of the way. And, and he wants to, because he wants us in the kingdom. Why would God only hide for a little bit of our life and then pop out every now and then? It, it doesn't make sense. He's there all the way. Magnify Yahweh with me and let's make him big. There was once a young girl by the end of the Sunday school lesson, she'd always have a drawing of what the Sunday school lesson was about. If it was uh, Noah's Ark, she'd have a picture, a beautiful picture of animals going to Noah's Ark. Uh, and you could think of any Sunday school lesson. But one day the Sunday school lessons was on Genesis chapter 1. And the Sunday school teacher said to her, well, maybe you could draw a picture of God, because it's all about God, Genesis chapter 1. And the little girl has drawn all these pictures for all this time in Sunday school said, no, I can't do that. And the teacher said, well, why not? And she said, the page wouldn't be big enough. And so for whatever concept her was of God, she said, I couldn't feel the page. And that's a beautiful concept that a child has of, of how great God is. You, you cannot feel the page, brothers and sisters. And we should never, if our life, brothers and sisters, and young people, was just a page, 
Sometimes to us, we are right in the middle of that page. We fill up every bit of that page and we put God in the corner. For that little girl, God was the whole page and she was just that little bit in the corner. No, I couldn't do that. The page would not be big enough. And we need to stop minimising God in life, stop minimising his power and his almightiness. In fact, sometimes what we do is we see our problems as too big in our lives as too small. Both are a serious mistake. Just turn with me to Psalm 145. There's a lovely quote again uh, about how great God is. And the first three verses, in fact, the whole psalm is excellent. But Psalm 145, we'll read the first three verses. And look what it says about God's greatness. I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name for ever and ever. Every day I will bless thee and I will praise thy name for ever and ever. Great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Now, he is beyond our little minds to, to comprehend. If we think that understanding how big the universe can be a difficult process, then trying to understand God is so much a bigger one as well and it can be so difficult. And yet we're told by the word the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth, and also added to that Isaiah 40. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out as the heavens the curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. He made the earth. It's just like unwrapping a tent at Glenlock for us. where We sit our old family around the tent. The earth was just like unwrapping a tent for God. That's how great or how unsearchable he is. It's so hard for us to comprehend those things. And of course, you go to Psalm 139, a few pages earlier, and he says, God is everywhere. Whither can I go? I cannot go to the deepest parts of the earth, the highest parts of the earth and the mountains. God is always there, and he is unsearchable. We know these pictures quite well from Sunday school, don't we? And some possibly inserts in our Bible, the seven days of creation. And we teach it to our children, and we believe those seven days. In fact, Moses did as well. If you turn with me to to, uh, Exodus chapter 20. And Moses in Exodus chapter 20, when giving the the Ten Commandments, he actually said this incredible verse about the Sabbath day in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, Verse... Verse 10 and 11, it says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy God. Uh, In verse 11, For in six days Yahweh made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, what do we read that verse for? We just have to think about this in creation. You know, we we all, we get older each year, we have birthdays and we we all get older. Um, I've got a 49th birthday coming up soon. Uh, why? Because the earth goes around the sun in 365 days, except for a leap year. And so creation, God based our one year of life upon how long the earth travels around the sun. We have one month, and we all do that. We, all, we have a month at a time, 12 months. It takes for how long the moon to travel around the earth. That's a creative thing that happened. We have one day because it's, take, it's how long it takes the earth to do one revolution. It goes around a day, an evening and a morning. We're, we're one day. And yet this one here in Exodus chapter 20 is something God made and we're still doing it today. This is God's amazing creative works. There is nothing for one week in creation. Only what God did in Genesis chapter 2 and, and sat there on the seventh day and rested from those works. And we still keep this principle today. So the the earth at large, who who may not want to accept that God exists, and yet all these things are in place from the first year, uh, one year, one month, one day, are actually keeping something that God made. Why? Because God blessed the Sabbath day, verse 11, and hallowed it. We try to change it today. We try to muck around with that principle uh, we should see creation as an incredible miracle. You know, brothers and sisters, if God wanted to, he could have made this whole earth, not in six days, he could have done it in six nanoseconds. Bang, just like that. If you can count all those stars up there, include the brightest star that's filled with more galaxies, which, which I found out in Perth, West, uh, Western Australia, God could have made this whole earth in six nanoseconds. But he taught a principle. And the principle was he took six days, rested on the seventh day to teach us a lesson. And people still do it today. It's incredible. Amazing. 
And we must see creation as an absolute miracle. God in creation is that great. His way is unsearchable, but he's done that for a reason. Everybody seen that page before? We all live and move and breathe by this page. We all love the bomb. Uh, the bomb gets us excited. We, 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 we live our lives around, around the bomb. Outings, weddings, fishing, holidays. Uh, we need this. It, we, we plan our lives around what's happening uh, on this. And we get excited about future forecasts and whatever. Well, you know, God actually <laughs> controls the weather. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. You think of that. He uses weather for judgment. And there's a whole heap of quotes there, earthquakes and fire and all sorts of things. He causes grass to grow for animals, Psalm 104. Fire, hail, snow, mist, stormy wind fulfill his word. So God is using all these elements to prove things, to, to manipulate things, to manage things in order for us to be in the kingdom. Plagues and pestilence for disobedience as well. Earthquakes are also were given by God. This turns me to Job 37. Have a look at just a classic little one here in Job 37 about why God sends rain upon the earth. Sometimes we just see these as ordinary things which just happen every day, but God is intimately involved in all these, these things. Look at Job 37 and verse 13. He causeth it to come. So he's talking about the rain. He talks about the snow and the rain in the early verses. In verse 13, he calls it to come, whether for correction or for his land or for mercy. So God actually brings his rain on purpose for those three particular reasons. So he controls the weather for correction. It's for punishment. Um, he does that for his land to keep the earth sustainable. Otherwise, it would be completely unsustainable if God didn't actually have the, the weather working in a certain way. But he also does it for mercy and for kindness. And, and, and though there are difficult times for farmers, as we know, uh, God gives rain and wonderful things for, out of his kindness and in his, as his mercy as well. He's control of these things. You might think, is that taking it a bit too far? Well, we quoted Jonah earlier. God controlled the weather and a big fish. When Jonah didn't, was running away from his responsibility, he said, just, uh, I'm not interested in doing it. I don't want to preach to those people out there. Why would I want to preach to them? The, the hope is only with Israel. And God says, well, guess what? I've already got a whale who never lives in the Mediterranean, already coming out through the Atlantic Ocean, coming into the Mediterranean, all ready to catch you by the time you fall out, that, out of that boat. You think of that. Months it would have taken for that whale to do that. Already in place. God's controlling that whale. Well, I've got no idea what it's doing. It's just, it just feels compelled to go into the Mediterranean. And Jonah falls out of the boat, swallowed up. He's in the gizzards for three days and three nights, pops out onto the ocean, onto the sea, sorry, seashore, Bang, he goes and does his job. So God controlled that. Yahweh prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. God feeds the birds. Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Your heavenly Father feedeth them. So next time you throw out some rubbish on the ground, think, oh, the, the, the pelicans or the seagulls are going to eat it. <laughs> That's God's way of, of feeding those animals. Now, sometimes we pass off a lot of these things as being natural. It's all managed by God. He loves his creation. We're the ones who mismanage and destroy his creation. We're the ones who kill off his animals and his plants and make many of those extinct. So that's the greatness of God in creation. So we're building up a picture of how great this God is. Yes, he is unsearchable. It's very difficult to understand everything that he does. But that's how great he is. And he's made us for a reason, for a purpose. Okay, so we've gone out into the universe, in, in the world and creation. Now let's go to political affairs and turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. And this again is worthwhile using your highlight. It's just to highlight what God does. So if God is great in, in his creation and what he still does in creation in looking after all these animals and all, these, uh, all his creation on this earth, how does he have time to do all this in politics in Daniel chapter 2? And we'll show the slide there as well. And these are the words in which you can highlight in Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And look what he does. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise, knowledge to them that know understanding. 
He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth in him. That's providence in politics and prophecy. Now, often we assume that other nations that rise and come because, well, that nation's got bigger guns than the other nation, or, or they had bigger axes than what the other one did, or they had bigger, mighty, brutier men. Well, they probably did. But God was made sure that that nation was going to be in control next because uh, they'd be enabled to have those things. God's the one in control. God is the one who does these things. And so, of course, we know the next quote in Daniel 4, verse 17. It's the Most High that rules in the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomsoever he will. We just think, oh, you know, um, Trump is the, the next president of America. He's a crazy person, got no idea why, and we, we pass it off. Uh, but God wants those people in, in the precise precisions for his purpose. In fact, at the end of that verse, um, as we have on the screen there, he gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basest of men. The word basest there means lowliest. And that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the lowliest of men who's going to be set up to be king of the whole earth. So not all the pomp and might is going to rule the earth in the future, brothers and sisters, but the humblest of men, the lowliest of men, Jesus Christ. And you think of the providence to actually have Jesus Christ come upon the earth 4,000 years into human history, everything that had to happen in order for a righteous man with the right circumstances to live for our salvation. God's choice is always perfect. He doesn't make poor choices. Sometimes we get poor leaders and we get poor rulers and they make poor choices, but they're all there because God does that, Daniel 2 and Daniel chapter 4. Sometimes we get all hyped up about politics and you walk past a group of people in in the meeting and they're all talking about politics. Oh, it should have been the conservatives in power, it should have been the liberals or it should have been that. It does not matter one iota. If God was to change things, uh, reverse things completely in Australia, it would not matter. It is God's will who would be in, in charge. And we have to work with that. We have to live our best in that because God wanted it that way it had nothing to do with us how does he do that a couple other quotes this is, um, is an amazing story um, of Elisha and the Syrians were the ones who were chasing down Elisha they wanted to catch Elisha and they found him that he was at Dothan it's a great little story here because Elisha's servant was worried all the Assyrians are out there they're surrounding around the city they want to get you Elisha what are we going to do? We're in trouble. Uh, they're going to capture you. They'll probably kill me. What are we going to do? And so Elisha answered in verse 16, said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elisha prayed and said, Yahweh, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire round about Elisha. And so he opened up his eyes. His eyes were able to see all the angels that were out there. They were on their side. I think that's just an amazing verse in our Bibles. So when you look on a starry night, imagine each star represents an angel and they're watching over us, brothers and sisters, in life. This next verse um, is about Ahab. If, if we didn't have this verse, these couple of verses in the Bibles, we'd be the poorer for it. This is a great couple of verses which shows angelic discussion on, on how they're going to manipulate things in order to get rid of Ahab. A horrible King Ahab. Horrible king that had to be removed. And here's the angels actually talking about it. It says, Yahweh said, the Lord said, so maybe Michael the archangel was there in amongst the discussion. They said, who's going to persuade Ahab that he may go and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And all these angels get in and actually have a discussion about it. You think, surely God knows how they're going to do it. But he actually allows them the opportunity to discuss these things and work out that they didn't know. And then one angel pops up and says, well, I know what we'll do. I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. The other angel said, well, yeah, I reckon that'll work. You'll persuade him and go for it. And you read the rest of the chapter that exactly happened and, and, and Ahab did fall at Ramoth Gilead. Interestingly, though, it was actually someone shot an arrow at Venture, which killed Ahab. <laughs> you see how prophet is all, in all of these things. God's controlling situation. Angels are having a discussion about how we're going to do it. One of them says, yeah, that's a great idea. Good idea. Let's do it. They get there. Uh, someone else from the other army shoots an arrow adventure to hit... Uh, I can't remember who the other person was. It missed him. He must have ducked out of the way. Bang, hit Ahab. Arrow shot adventure. And that's God's providence at work. Uh, great verse. And that's what happens. So you imagine when you go to sleep at night and God who slumbers not nor sleeps 
Our angels are all having a discussion. What are we going to do tomorrow morning for, for, for Brother Rick? Gee, he was, he was terrible today. He did some shocking things today. Well, what are we going to do with him tomorrow to actually uh, to, to make his faith a bit stronger so he doesn't do those things again? And they have those discussions at night time. And they talk about the future day's events. We, go, we wake up in the morning, get the sleep out of the eyes, and we have no idea uh, about all those discussions. But that's why this verse is so important. While we're in Daniel, let's go to Daniel chapter 10. This is uh, incredible. I, I love Daniel chapter 10. Because they listen to us, brothers and sisters. They actually listen to what we say. They listen to our prayers. And Daniel chapter 10 is a classic example of Daniel who, who's been mourning for, for three full weeks in the earlier verses of Daniel chapter 10. Uh, it says that in verse 2 and also in verse 3. Waiting till the prophecies of Jeremiah will be fulfilled. He'd be praying for three weeks, waiting for an answer. And it's like us. We pray for answers, brothers and sisters, and young people, and we don't get them straight away. Well, here's a great example of prayers don't always get answered in the way that we want or in the time frame that we want. And you get later in the, in the chapter, uh, verse 10, And behold, an hand touched me, set me upon my knees. So he's been prostrated on the ground, praying to God, when are these things going to happen? When, when is the Babylonians going to let us go back to the land again? And the angel says, in, actually, look, set me upon the palms of my hands. Verse 11, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Uh, that's how much the angel loved Daniel. But he couldn't get to him for three full weeks. He said, I wanted to get to you. Uh, thy words were heard. We, we, I heard your words. Uh, you are upright and all these things, but I just could not get to you. Uh, verse 12, he said, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that thou hast set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard. We heard them all. And I'm come for those words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and I had to get Michael, the archangel, to help me. <laughs> it's, it's a great section, isn't it? So here's a, a prophet prostrate on the ground, praying, when are these things going to happen? I've been in Babylon for 70 years. When's it going to happen? Angel takes three weeks to get to him, taps him on the shoulder, lifts him up again, and says, look, I'll be listening to you. I just couldn't get to you because we've been so busy making sure that these prophecies... Remember Daniel chapter 2? Yeah, I remember that. We had to make sure that the gold and silver, the, the brass and, and all, and the silver and the brass all had to work out. And I actually had to get Michael to help me as well. Two mighty angels cooperating together, and then finally he can get back to Daniel and help him. And then Daniel chapter 10 is a classic to show that God can move nations, but at the same time he cares. So he's moving the nations, he's manipulating millions of people, uh, the thoughts and intents of, of rulers, but at the same time he cares for a little prophet in Babylon. You know, God can manipulate 200 nations at a time. Kings, queens, presidents, prime ministers, people's thoughts and opinions, while all at the same time hear our prayers. Have you ever thought on a Sunday morning when you're giving thanks for your bread and wine, how many prayers are being offered on a Sunday morning throughout the whole world? Thousands. Whilst at the same time, uh, Russia's being manipulated, uh, Putin, Trump, uh, Europe, the Brexit, you know, <laughs> They'll get us sorted out one day. But all these things are happening. And they listen to all of our prayers. And we need to appreciate that God is just as interested in our lives as he is with the nations. You know, sometimes we feel so insignificant, so unimportant, don't we? Why would the high and lofty one, the one who inhabits eternity, want anything to work with me in my life? What purpose do I fulfil in ecclesial life or in this life in which I live? And this chapter of Daniel chapter 10 shows that it does happen. God is interested. It is happening today in your life and in my life. And so we all have a personal angel. And this is four lovely quotes, which I think if you tie all these things together, brothers and sisters, at the time of baptism at least, if not before baptism, an angel has been dispatched to every single one of us. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister then that shall be heirs of salvation? The angel of Yahweh encamps around those that fear him and delivereth him. He pitches a tent around us wherever we go in life. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Or a classic one in Acts chapter 12 where, where there was a, a, a woman outside uh, crazily saying that Peter's been loosed out of prison and everybody said inside, no, it's not a woman, it's just his angel. 
So, so you put all these things together, brothers and sisters. We, we have a, a personal angel with us uh, every, day, every day assigned to us. Because God doesn't leave anything to chance. Be aware that of their presence. Thank God for them. Don't frustrate their work. <laughs> I frustrate my angel many times in life. And he's still there, and you know, he's still working in my life through different circumstances. Uh, they're not policemen. They don't take a tally necessarily of all of our sins. They very well may do that. But God is a God of mercy, and God loves to show compassion, and they're there to help us to the kingdom. You know, we show this often, and I should get rid of the translation, uh, transitions for this slide. We show this all the time in uh, lectures, don't we? Uh, Daniel chapter 2, and we say, this is God telling the future. No, that's what a prophet does. A prophet tells the future. What, the, what Daniel chapter 2 is saying is what God is going to do. That's what Daniel chapter 2 is all about. Prophecy is not telling you about, uh, about the future, but rather it's telling you what God is going to do. Now, there are many astrologers who might try and tell what the future is. Read the horoscopes in the newspaper that might try and tell you what the future is going to be. Daniel chapter 2, prophecy is telling you what God will do, and it does happen, and we've seen it happen in our life. And so we quote this one all the time as well. Remarkable, I did this slide 20 so years ago. It's so applicable today as what it was then, or back in the 1800s from the Elvis Israel days. And everything is into alignment. Incredible, it's happening right before our very eyes. God is doing it right before our very eyes, brothers and sisters. Why should he not be doing things in our life? Uh, I'll just quickly glibly go over this, but if you look at all the three time periods of Daniel chapter 12, this is probably blinding you with science. Every major uh, time period in, in history, you add those time periods to it, it hits another major time period. It's incredible. Uh, so God is, is, is amazingly working through history and through prophecy. But I won't blind you with that one too much. Isaac Newton wrote a book on the prophecy of Daniel. This is what he said about prophecy. Read closely. The folly of interpreters has been to foretell times and things by this prophecy, as if God designed to make them prophets. By this rashness, they have not only exposed themselves, but brought the prophecy also into contempt. The design of God was much otherwise. He gave this and the prophecies of the Old Testament not to gratify men's curiosities by enabling them to foreknow things, but that after they were fulfilled, they might be interpreted by the event and his own providence, not the interpreters. You think of that. Now, he didn't have the truth, Isaac Newton, but he had a brilliant mind and he saw providence working in those things. You know, as he wrote more on that, he actually wrote a summary of what he thought about providence. This is so applicable to us, brothers and sisters, and young people. Prophecy gives us greater confidence in Scripture. Absolutely. Prophecy gives us greater appreciation of God's control of all things. Prophecy makes us more religious, more devoted, and more committed. Does it do that for you? Next time you hear about Brexit, you think, oh, I've had enough of hearing about that. When there's actually prophecy, God doing it right before our very eyes. Does it make you more religious, more devoted, more committed? Well, that's what Isaac Newton said back in the 1700s. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies are being fulfilled accurately by God. This is harder than creation. You think, creation, he spoke, bang, we have, it, we have the universe. <laughs> Just like that. But you think of manipulating history for 6,000 years. Now, in creation, he spoke the earth into existence, but with prophecy, there are so many contingencies to worry about. You've got kings are stubborn, you've got influencing nations, millions of people, circumstances surrounding all those things, and you've got to do that over 2,500 years to make the image stand up. Now, we can understand DNA, we can understand molecules, and we can understand creation, maybe, but to understand that is just incredible. How do you change men's minds on a national basis to fulfil your will? And only a great God can do that. Um, I certainly couldn't, and neither could you. All to achieve a single outcome, that God is doing these things. Just want you to think about this for a moment. You know, back in the religious revival in the 1800s, and I learnt this from Brother Stephen Hill, I looked it up, and it's true. When Brother Thomas was born, 1805, the steam engine was invented. 
that same year. You think, okay, what's so special about that? Well, actually, sorry, the steam engine was late 1700s, but in 1805, the steam engine was then put to a prop in a boat. So huge amounts of travel could be made. Brother Thompson could go and preach over in America. So the same year in which he was born, that happened. People could now travel days and what took, uh, travel in days what took weeks and months. In 1843, the steam engine was then developed into a printing press. And then people like Brother Thomas could print thousands of heralds to preach the truth. And here we are today because of it. So you can see the providence of God working with technology in order to help the truth being presented in the 1800s and up until our day. And we still have technology today, don't we? We have it in our pockets, in our hands, uh, in our desks, right, right here in my desk, right here as well. And what do we do with this technology? Do we preach the truth? Or do we say, wow, God has provided this. I can print all these heralds, all these leaflets and preach the truth? You know, people use the current technology, brothers and say, they put it on a page, I baked a cake today. Wow. Oh, I have a runny nose today. And there's a selfie picture of it. Oh, I got a new little kitten and it used its kitty litter for the first time today. Most of this technology we should be using for preaching the gospel, preaching the truth, finding out about our God. Now, sometimes we are so preoccupied in the trivial, we forget the bigger picture of our God, that we are not trivial in his sight. We're not trivial in the eyes of God. Let's keep the trivial of this life to a minimum. Because, we, and we love this quote, don't we? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, let's, I think we're ready for it now. We're now ready for providence in our personal lives. And we'll ask the same questions again that we asked at the start of the class. How close is God to you? How do you see God working in your life? Have you ever written a list of all those things so you can look back in the past and say, yeah, that's where God worked, that's where God worked, that's where God worked, to give you that encouragement in times of need? The slant we want to take is, what about the things we suffer in life, the trial that we go through in life? And it's a good question that needs answering. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 for a moment. So we've looked at creation, God and creation. We've looked at the greatness of God in politics. Just a few smatterings of verses. Now we draw to ourselves, we, we come back closer to the globe and we look at us who consider ourselves but nothing in the sight of God. But we are not trivial in his sight at all. We go to 1 Peter 1 and there's a great introduction in the first four verses. We've got a wonderful inheritance, incorruptible in verse 4, undefiled, reserved for us. But look at verse 5. Who are kept, they're talking about, about us who are called, who are kept by the power of God through faith under salvation. The word kept there means to be a watcher in advance, to mount as a guard or a sentinel. So God is keeping us like he's a guard out in front of us, watching over us in life. And with that, he's got a hope set before us, undefiled, incorruptible, reserved for us, keeping us by his power. Verse 5. So all he does, all these things in creation, he's, he's mindful of the sparrows and every animal that dies. He, he can name all the stars. Uh, he can manipulate millions of people. He keeps a watch out on us every single day of our life. The NIV says, shielded. And it's from a root word to protect. It's a wonderful picture of God watching over us, guarding over us. The invading army is coming. He's out in front watching and guarding for us and protecting us from those things. If God can be for us, who can be against us? And we get the picture that we're invincible. Nothing could ever happen in our life. The Almighty God is for us. And yet suffering and trial happens. Why does God allow it? Brother Robert Roberts calls it divinely controlled evil. You know, the very best experience at present is only a state of divinely controlled evil. The divine regulation of this may and does permit the experience of evil in severe forms by his people. Some of Jacob's experiences, however, show that the cruelest and apparently most aimless wrench of affliction 
may be but the preparation for the highest blessedness even now. It may not have come just yet. And so we do suffer evil in life. We do have difficulties in life, some things which we don't understand, and we may never do this side of the kingdom. In fact, providence is not always what we expect. And Melva Perkis and Cyril Tennant wrote this lovely poem in their book on prayers, studies and principles and practice. Now you think about this, what we pray for and what our outcomes are at times. He asked for strength that he might do greater things, but was given infirmity that he might do better things. He asked for riches that he might be happy. He has given poverty that he might be wise. He asked for power that he might have praise of men. He was given weakness that he might feel the need of God. Uh, you can put the Apostle Paul there next to that one. He, was asked all, he asked for all things that he might enjoy life. He was given life that he might enjoy all things. He had received nothing that he asked for, but he gained more than he hoped for. I think that absolutely depicts us, brothers and sisters, in life. We may not get every single prayer that we ask for answered, but we'll get more than what we ever could, guaranteed by our God in the kingdom and beyond. If you consider a moment for the suffering Job, you know, Job was honourable when he suffered hugely. He lost property, he lost cattle, he lost his livelihood, he lost his family, he lost almost everything, and finally he lost his dignity, scraping the pus off his body with a piece of pottery. And his wife actually turns around and says, just curse God and die. And Job's response was honourable, where he says, shall we not receive good at the hand of God? There's that word hand again, pops up all the time. And shall we not receive evil? In all this did Job not sin with his lips. He had the perfect answer. He didn't need a reason for it. Uh, God gives good things, God gives bad things. Uh, and they're all for, that, for a purpose. For the Olam, uh, he doesn't do anything without a cause. Uh, now we can put all these things together and it starts to sink in and we start to appreciate just how amazing this God is in our life. He can do all these things in creation, all these things in politics, but he's so intimately involved in our life. And Job recognised that. So what we've done, brothers and sisters, and we can chat about this afterwards, and we've, we've had a bit of help from people over the years with this, is try to put uh, in, in format the four reasons for why we might suffer in life. Uh, we've got there, firstly, it's because of the curse. Uh, there could be trials of our faith. It could be chastisement for obedience. Or it could be to help someone else. Um, and I've tried to you know, put other uh, areas underneath those as well. You just think about the first one, the curse. Now, we're all mortal. We're all prone to sin. Suffering is going to happen, uh, definitely in our life. There's nothing we can do about this. We are born into this world. We are born into this, uh, this world in which we live. And there'll be internal things like stress, disease, and, and, and death, as well as those external things. There'll be murders and thefts, oppressions, and accidents. These are the things that we pay. It's the price we pay for living in this earth. Uh, young boys, you might like driving your cars very fast. Uh, the laws of the curse says, well, if you go too fast, you might have an accident. And, and you might hurt yourself. And someone else as well. Uh, that's what we get for living in this, in this world and, and for, uh, for being silly at times. It's a statistical inevitability that some of those things, because of the curse, will happen to us. We all get the common cold once a year. Maybe a flu every, every few years. Cancers, hearing loss, and death of loved ones. We're not given exemptions from any of those things. They are normal consequences of living upon this earth. But the beauty is, as we showed, our life is in the hand of our God, our wonderful, loving, heavenly Father. Study that thing farther in your bowls, and you'll absolutely adore God forever for that. Our lives are in his hands. But however... We're not subject uh, to, to time and chance as the world is. We're in his hands and all these circumstances can be intervened if needed. The second one is the trial of our faith, uh, which comes up in 1 Peter 1 and verse 7. So while God might guard us in verse 5 as a sentinel, we also have the trials of our faith in life. 
And that's essential. We need it. God wants faith. God wants to see faith. Uh, if you go back to Abraham's life, uh, why did Abraham have to sacrifice his son in, in Genesis ch- chapter 22? It wasn't to prove Abraham. It was to improve Abraham. And it wasn't so much to prove to God that he had faith, but to show Abraham that his faith was getting stronger. See the difference? God, it's, it's like prayer, brothers and sisters. It's like God knows what we're going to say. But we need to show, show our faith to God that we need to say it to him. And he needs to hear those things, despite that he knows what we're going to say. So he gives us the trials of our life. We need these circumstances is to see if faith is evident or not. And it challenges us to say, well, how much faith do I have in God? Who can count the stars, who can name them all, who knows when a sparrow dies and is a gardener sentinel to me. And God won't relent to give us those trials in our life. The third one is chastisement for disobedience. And we get those in life. Suffering as a punishment for basically being naughty. And we get those. And we go all throughout the whole Bible and there's plenty of those as examples. We don't like itemising that to our own life, do we? Have you ever thought about the naughty things you've done in life and whether trials were a punishment for that? Have you ever thought about that? I guarantee you haven't thought about it very much. Because human nature doesn't want to accept it. We don't like saying sorry, uh, let alone admitting that we make mistakes. But God did that. He did it to David uh, and so many other people biblically. Chastisement for for being naughty. And also to help someone else out. Joseph's family benefited from from Joseph's trial. I'm not sure too many other people could have gone through what Joseph did in order to save a whole family, but he did. The thing of the greatest person who ever lived went through so much suffering for our salvation 2,000 years later. We're here because of that. And we're sitting here tonight learning about, it, about providence and being thankful to God that he, his son went through so much to help others out. Paul suffered as an example that we might be followers of Christ even as we're followers of, of him as well. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You think, well, which one? <laughs> When I'm suffering something in my life and there's some trial happening, how do I know which one it is? <laughs> we actually don't. It's very hard to itemise that and now look, we don't know. It could be one, it could be, it could be a couple of them at a time, it could be all of them maybe at a time. Uh, it could be all of them at the same time. It's very bit difficult to know which one it is. And yet the funny thing is, here's the next question that goes with it. Why is it, brothers and sisters and young people, when someone else is suffering, we always seem to know what the reason for it is. And we don't mind telling them either. And that's probably one of the worst things you can do. Isn't that what Job's friends did? Job, we know why you've been suffering, because you've been the most rottenest sinner ever for suffering these things. They thought the same in, in John chapter 9. A man born blind. Uh, who committed this sin? Him or his parents, that he was born blind. We shouldn't be like Job's three friends and point the finger at people and say, I know why you're suffering, but rather be helpful. doesn't answer my first question, though, does it? What should we do then when we're in times of trial and suffering, which God brings upon us in life? Which one is it? Pick one. And work with God on it. You might not know which one it is, brothers and sisters, but work with God on it. If it's the curse, you think, okay, I'm suffering something because it's, it's the curse. And you say, well, I'm going to accept that God has allowed this to happen and learn to patiently endure. I'm going to use a quote of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse 7 to have patient continuance and well-doing, whatsoever the circumstances, and my faith will be developed because of that. Or you might say, no, I, I think it might be, I don't know what it is, but it might be the trial of my faith. And so what it's teaching you, brothers and sisters and young people, make God bigger in your life, therefore. If it's a trial of your faith, make it bigger and see that God is trying to strengthen your faith. And see out the other side of it, your faith has been strengthened because of it. You might think, well, maybe it is what I'm suffering, the chastisement for disobedience. Accept the punishment. And that God does love those whom he chastises. Determined to do better. Every time you take the emblems, you're determined to do better every Sunday. Maybe what you're suffering, you might think, is is to help others out. Well, you think, well, if that's the case, decide that if whatever you're suffering is, is to help others out, no matter how difficult it might be, 
I'm going to be the best example possible for other people to take from that. You know, you may not get it right, but at least you've committed yourself to God and communicated with him. you tried to work out a solution with your God. It's better than saying, oh, it's too hard. It's better than saying, well, I don't really want to know. I'm just going to put it to one side and worry about it later. Or better than what the world says, and I don't care. And suffer in silence and slowly come out the other side. You know, God brings all these things upon our life. We may not know what the circumstances were or why God did these things in our life or allowed them to happen. It doesn't matter if we get the diagnosis wrong. But what it means is we get to change something in our life and be better for it. That's great anyway. At least we're trying to work with our God. Our faith is improving and developing. And so as we saw this slide very quickly last week, David cooperated with providence. The Lord worked with David, but a working David was up and doing to be worked with. David's faith-generated impulse was supplemented by the guidance of the Spirit and the cooperation of the divine hand. But if there had been no zealous, enterprising, God-believing David, there would have been no faith-generated impulse to supplement. So how do we do this? How do we cooperate with God? Well, we ask ourselves those four questions. Is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Is it this one? Uh, is there something I need to change my life? Pick one of those and do it. Develop greater faith. Make God big in your life. Wake up every morning in life, brothers and sisters. Talk to God. Communicate with God. Read about God. As you rub the sleep out of your eyes, think how blessed you are. His mercies are renewed every morning. Read that psalm. Every single verse. We get bored of reading those psalms. Every verse is, is a, is a catalogue of God's blessings to us. Take God with you in thought for the day. It's not a sin to ask why. And even Job asked why as well in Job chapter 3. You know, we don't always get the answers that we want in life. Job was never told why his sufferings were for. He didn't know. He won't find out until the kingdom. But there are no surprises in heaven. God is in control. Nothing catches God unprepared or unawares or unconcerned. He may not have given a reason to Job, but Job turned his life around and was much better off for it, and so can ours. We're going to leave you with a few more slides, but these ones are particularly Robert Roberts's uh, benchmark quotes, I call them. <laughs> So these are his benchmark quotes. Read the ways of providence. You'll find all the way through, these are, these are the ones that mean the most to him. And hopefully tonight, as we, we've gone out into creation, we've gone into politics, and we've gone into our lives, and the real dark areas of things which we suffer in life, uh, we can use these benchmark quotes as well. That your father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. He knows. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. Cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. You think of that. This is his benchmark quotes. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Sometimes those paths are rocky. Sometimes those paths are difficult. But he will direct it, and you know that as a, as a surety. The steps of a good man are ordered by Yahweh, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for Yahweh upholdeth him with his hand. There's our hand again. I have been young and now I'm old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And there are Robert Roberts' benchmark quotes, and maybe we have our own. And I have a couple of my own, which I might show one night as well. You know, as we're precious to God, we're not insignificant, we're not trivial in God's sight. We're preciable, precious, we're valuable or we're rare. You think of all these quotes in the Bible, from oppression and violence, he redeems their life. Precious is their blood in his sight. Precious in the sight of Yahweh is the death of his saints. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life. Precious is their blood in his sight. And he goes all the way through, through the Bible. So the trial of our faith is precious to God in 1 Peter 1 and verse 7. And we are God's special jewels, which means a special treasure in Malachi 3 and verse 7. Never think that you're trivial. Never think that you don't mean anything to God. You do. And there's a reason, there's a purpose for why you're here upon this earth and in the things that you suffer at times. Because God does want to give us the kingdom. It is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. 
You know, sometimes we get excited about we give our child their first bike for their birthday and it's so exciting watching them on their bike and, and wriggling around and, and finally get, they get the hang of it. And it's an excitement for us giving a first present to somebody. But what this shows, brothers and sisters, is that God is excited to give us the kingdom. He can't wait to give us the kingdom. And he's doing everything in our life in order to, to, to help us and develop our faith to make us ready for it. He's excited about it. Are you? Am I? Are we just as excited for the kingdom as what God is? So just quickly, our lessons for tonight. Great is God is great. His work's unsearchable. We don't need to work out all the scientific details. Just trust him. <laughs> He's unsearchable. We don't understand all things, how they work. Just trust him. Magnify God and never make him small. On the page of our life, make God a lot bigger on that page and make ourselves a bit smaller. Have confidence that he is interested in us. We are worth more than many sparrows. An animal that we just consider as sparrows, we're far more worth to God than that. Remember to use prophecy as a tool to make your life more committed to God. The next time you hear a current events talk, they should make your life more religious, more devoted, more committed to God. And that was a non-religious person who said that in Isaac Newton. Remember that in the, in the grand scheme of prophecy, we're not trivial. God wants to be, us to be a part of it. You actually think of it. God is developing prophecy for us. He's developing everything ready for us and the kingdom. There are many purposes for suffering which we may never understand this side of the kingdom. Trust him and he knows the bigger picture. And when in trial, ask the four questions to see what the purpose may be and make the changes necessary. God wants to give us the kingdom and is excited about it. Are we just as excited about receiving it from him? What I'd like to do is finish. Everybody's seen this before. Um, I'd like to finish by reading this. It's footprints in the sand. One night I dreamed as I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was one, set, one only. This bothered me much because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow or, or defeat, I could only see one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, You promised me, Lord, that if I followed you and would walk with you always. But I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there has only been one set of footprints in the stand. Why? When I needed you the most, you have not been there for me. And the Lord replied, the years when you have seen only one set of footprints, my child, is when I carried you.